Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Mullen, and beyond, on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, eBooks in Academic Libraries, Conceptualizing and Communicating Their Value and Impact, sponsored by Springer and featuring Megan Oakleaf, Associate Professor at Syracuse University. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will also see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We will spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please do feel free to submit these throughout the program. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. Our featured speaker today is Megan Oakleaf, and here to introduce her is Christy Showers, who serves as Library Marketing Specialist for North America at Springer. Christy? Thanks, Laura. Uh, we're very excited to have Megan Oakleaf here today to speak about the value of eBooks in academic libraries. Megan is Associate Professor of Library and Information Science in the iSchool at Syracuse University. She is author of The Value of Academic Libraries Comprehensive Review and Report and has earned recognition and awards for articles published in top library and information science journals including College and Research Libraries, Portal, Reference and User Services Quarterly, and Journal of Documentation. Megan has presented at numerous conferences, including the American Library Association, Association of College and Research Libraries, and EDUCAUSE. Her research areas include outcome assessment, evidence-based decision making, information literacy instruction, and academic library impact and value. And also with me today is my colleague Dan Vallen, Senior Account Manager for the Northeast. Dan will be available during the Q&A session to assist in answering any questions. Yeah. And at this point, uh, we're ready to get started, so Megan, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts on eBooks in academic libraries. I hope that today we can start some new conversations and continue existing dialogues about the value and impact of eBooks on our users, stakeholders, and the overarching institutions in which we work. I think it would be great if you could use this opportunity to engage with others at your institution about this topic, and I welcome follow-up questions or comments. We can all learn from each other, so hopefully we can engage several questions at the end of this webinar. Here is our topic for the next 45 minutes or so. We'll cover various ways to defi define ebook value and learn about ways some researchers are demonstrating the value of ebooks. We'll consider different types of data and evidence that may speak to the value of ebooks, and we'll also explore ways librarians are attempting to communicate that value. So let's get started. First, let's discuss how we might define value when it comes to ebooks. Their value isn't always clear, especially when you examine recent higher education literature which tends to focus on other issues surrounding ebooks. If you scan the higher education literature on ebooks, both scholarly and popular sources, what tends to stand out is a pro-con discussion. Several studies have documented the challenges of working with ebooks. In general, when it comes to books, students tend to prefer print to electronic, electronic formats still, especially in their coursework, which is our main concern in academic libraries. A lot of this sentiment can be attributed to the difficulty knowing the ebooks exist and discovering them in the first place. Certainly, in some disciplines, relatively few ebooks do exist. Once an ebook is found, it can be hard or even impossible to access, navigate, browse, download, print, copy, or save. And of course, they have ergonomic issues, such as being pretty hard on the eyes, etc. Having said that, the literature also acknowledges that ebooks cost less thereby making higher education more affordable. 
and that is a huge plus when nearly all institutions are attempting to increase their affordability. Ebooks can be accessed most of the time by multiple users and around the clock. In theory, they're portable, although many college students eschew e-readers for their laptops, which they tend not to lug around campus, and other mobile devices, which can exacerbate the eye strain problem. And as you'll notice, we just did the conversation in the literature cycles around from the pros to the cons again. Except for the issue of affordability, ebook literature of this type really focuses more on the issues that do not speak directly to value. These are usability issues, access issues, and collection issues. While obviously important and tied to issues of value, they are not the same thing. Oh, and in case you're interested, here are a few examples of the type of literature I was just discussing. Clearly, you can't take all of this in uh, as, as quickly as this slide is going to go by, but um, this will be archived, as I said, so you can get these sources later if you like. Anyway, uh, I so strongly suspect that most of the issues currently highlighted in the literature are temporary, and in coming years, we'll sort them out. I believe ebooks will become increasingly like other packets of information, more and more easily discoverable and usable. Certainly, we've made major project progress with e-journal collections, and I think it's reasonable to believe that the same will hold true with ebooks. So, in the future, the barriers to successful ebook usage will be overcome and a thing of the past. So, let's not overemphasize those issues any further today. Let's go ahead and turn our focus to ebook value. I should acknowledge at this point that I'm taking a particular perspective on value in the rest of this presentation. Some of you might be familiar with this document, which ACRL commissioned a few years ago. I was the author, and the work I did on this report has definitely influenced my take on value. Indeed, one of the main questions this report spurred was, well, what do you mean by value? Certainly, there are many different definitions of library value, and for today's discussion, ebook value. For the next several minutes, I'm going to take the, some of the same perspective as I did in the report, uh, i.e., value in the context of institutional mission. This perspective asks us to consider interesting questions like, to what degree does the library play a valued role in the ability of the institution, community college, college, or university, to meet its institutional mission, such as strategic goals, priorities, outcomes, etc.? This means not focusing on the value of the library for the library's sake, but rather the value of the library within an institutional context. How does the library help the institution achieve its goals? And these kinds of questions lead naturally to some other questions. If you are in a position of describing library value to your stakeholders, like students, parents, faculty, administrators, resource allocators, accreditors, community members, what kinds of data or evidence would be compelling? What kinds of data or evidence would show you that the library, or your stakeholders, that the library really achieved their goals, not just our goals as librarians? So using the same perspective, let's consider ebook value. What is value when it comes to ebooks? How do we measure the value of ebooks within this larger context? How do we know whether ebooks are valuable within an institutional framework? How do we know if ebooks help stakeholders achieve their goals? What kinds of data or evidence would be compelling if you had to make an argument for ebook value to a resource allocator at your institution? There are many several there are several approaches. Let's examine them one by one. One definition of value that comes quickly to mind is satisfaction. That's a typical place for librarians to start. How happy are users with us? How happy are they with our, our e-books that we provide? Satisfaction can be measured in many ways and with many different tools, surveys, focus groups, interviews, and so on. Ultimately, these tools yield some kind of measure of user satisfaction, and we always hope to find out that users are indeed satisfied. So imagine that you've conducted focus groups with your faculty and one of the things you asked them about was the level of, their level of satisfaction with regard to ebook collections, the ones you offer at your institution. You do some analysis and you summarize it as you might typically summarize other satisfaction data. Perhaps like this. You decide to express your results with a percentage of the population that is satisfied. In this particular example, I guess that's not a great number, but let's just think this through. If 23% of your faculty are satisfied, according to your assessment, with the ebook collection in their area of research, what does that mean? Is that a high number or a low one? Do you know why they're satisfied or not? 
Do you need to analyze this again, factoring in the discipline area of each faculty member? There may be a number of ways you could act on this result as a manager of an ebook collection. But how does this really stack up when it comes to defining value? Is this a compelling data point that you could share with your stakeholders? Could you approach a resource allocator at your institution with this data and feel that you've conveyed accurately and well the value of ebooks in contributing to the goals of the institution? If I put myself in their shoes, so if I'm imagining that I have resources to allocate at an institution and I have to decide where to put those resources, I think my response to this kind of data would be a big, so what? For instance, I might have a lot bigger issues on my mind than satisfaction. That's nice, but I want actual results, not just feelings, right? I also don't have much context for this number. Is this percent normal, expected, better or worse than average? And all of a sudden, I just don't care. I don't find this statistic interesting, let alone actionable. It's nice to know, but I don't need to act on it. So let's see what else we've got. Let's go to another possible facet of, of ebook value. Service quality. Imagine now that you've put an assessment into play that will tell you how your users feel about the quality of the services you, pro you provide, your hours, your customer service, ease of access, et cetera, et cetera. In this imaginary instrument, you've asked about ebooks and whether or not the ebook collection and services are acceptable. A typical data point from this approach might be something like this. Okay, so in this imagining, we've done a little better than in satisfaction. More than half of our users think the collection and services related to ebooks are acceptable. But again, so what? What's the context for this statistic? Is it low or high? I suppose we could benchmark that data, and that would give it more context. But it would still be just a piece of information that we could use to better manage the service. That's important, but it wouldn't give us an answer to the question, what difference do ebooks make? And as a consequence, if I put on my resource allocator hat, I still don't care. It's still a big, so what? All right, so let's, let's give it another shot. Aha. This time, being librarians, we will do some counting. Perhaps we will look at our internal systems and determine that we have grown the ebook collection. We now have X number of ebooks, and we used to only have Y number. So we have improved and are now more valuable, right? Not so fast. If I'm a resource allocator again, I might think this number is nice, but again, there's no context. So what? What difference did that increase make? How did the increase help individuals and users as a whole meet their needs, achieve goals, attain outcomes? This data point doesn't tell us that. So let's try yet again. You may now be thinking, yeah, we need to know about use. OK, so let's consider use statistics as a measure of ebook value. Typically, ebook use data sounds sort of like this. A lot of people downloaded a lot of things. I mean, it's usually more sophisticated than that, but when it boils down, that's what you have. So again, so what? Did they read them, discard them as irrelevant, recycle them? Or perhaps some of what they downloaded changed their lives, helped them achieve all kinds of goals, personal, professional, institutional, et cetera. We just don't know. So maybe we should revise this to say, a lot of People downloaded a lot of things. We're not sh sure who, we're not sure what, and we're not sure what difference any of it made. So I'm thinking I'd feel pretty silly going to a resource allocator with that kind of data. And if I was a resource allocator, again, I wouldn't find this an expression of ebook value that was very compelling, at least not without a lot more information than we are currently offering. All right, let's try yet another approach. What if we tried to quantify the financial value of the ebook collection? What is it worth monetarily? So we do a calculation and we determine that the financial value of the ebook collection is some amount. Is this meaningful? Is that number a lot, a little? What do we compare it to? If it's worth X amount but it's just sitting around, again, does it help achieve goals? Still, yet, we need more context. One way to give more context is to take a return on investment approach. 
What's the return on the money and other resources we've expended in the ebook collection? There are a number of ways to calculate ROI, although I need to caution that many of them are a bit troublesome in a higher education environment. How do you assign a financial value to the return? If you look at grants received using library resources, you have dollars on either side of the equation. Grants, the money received, and the library resource expenditures. And so you could determine how many ebooks were cited in grant proposals and how much money was received through the grant fund. This is akin to the Illinois and Live Value studies you may already be familiar with, and it's really interesting work. But estimating other things can be challenging. How do you put a dollar figure on faculty activities other than grant seeking? You could use faculty salaries as a stand-in, I suppose, and divide, divide that by time spent. Bruce Kingma and others have tried that approach with a great deal of success. Students are tougher, though. I'm not sure I'm convinced that tuition, for example, is a good stand-in for student ROI measures. So let's, let's look at this a little more generally. Imagine you did an ROI study to examine the return on investment for eBooks. You might end up with results that sounded sort of like this. We do more with less. As in, we saved money, or you gave us less money, and we did really well with it. Our eBooks cost less than print books, and we found ways, through being good librarians, to get more resources for less money. Fine. That's great. But if I'm a resource allocator, the light just went off. Here is a cost savings. I can put the money that I thought the library might need elsewhere. I'm happy, but maybe not for the reasons a librarian would want me to be happy. By the way, it is true that ebooks cost less. If we examine some excellent work done by Tina Krasowski and as a part, again, of the Live Value Project, we learn all of these things. Ebooks are less expensive per purchase and per use. They're less expensive to lend, to store, and preserve. And we don't have to purchase multiple copies anymore. This is cool information, and I recommend it as further reading for all of you. Tina's also just presented at the Charleston Conference, and there's more research results on the way. Some of these are in the Illinois Institutional Repository called Ideals. You can just search by your name and find tons of great stuff on this topic. Sometimes, though, to return on to the ROI results scenario for a moment, there are other kinds of messages that may result. For example, sometimes libraries have their budgets cut so badly that they turn to ebooks in a way as a way to maintain the status quo. So the message is the message isn't that the library has been able to add resources through purchases of ebooks, but rather that they're just managing not to lose too many. This situation might also cause a resource allocator to say, well, that's not too bad. I gave you less, and no harm done. Cool. Which, of course, is not the reaction most of our colleagues would be looking for either. And occasionally, this happens too. The library receives less funding, and despite good collection decision making, there's no getting around the reality that the collection suffers. You'd think that this would be enough to spur action, right? That resource allocators would say, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, here's your money back with my apologies. Unfortunately, what often happens is that no one notices, or rather, the people who do notice are not the ones who can do anything about it. So let's look at one more dimension of value. Impact. What do I mean by impact? I mean the value of ebooks in meeting the needs of users. The difference that ebooks make in the lives of users, the goals that ebooks help them achieve, the needs that ebooks help them meet, the outcomes they help them attain. In other words, not how much good or not how good is the ebooks collection, but rather how much good do we do users do with the collection? This kind of metric gets at how much really that our stakeholders, our users can do, not what we're doing. This is a good metric that resource allocators understand and appreciate. So let's take a closer look at this notion. What difference do ebooks make? The difference ebooks make is completely dependent on what your users do with the books, the ebooks in your collection. So ask yourself. What are users? What do your users do with the ebooks in your collection? And how much do you really know about that? How do students, faculty, and other stakeholders use your ebooks? What do they accomplish? And are they the things that they're, are they accomplishing the things that your institution would value? 
So let's talk about the things that give context and value from an impact perspective. There are things that your institution cares about a lot, like the institutional mission, their goals, strategic priorities, and focus areas. So let's pause for a second and think about this. If we're going to define uh, ebook value as being within the context of what the institution cares about, let's take a second to all sort of respond to what it is your institution cares about. And please note that you can select more than one. Oh, this is fun watching you all log in and weigh in. Look, there's a lot of focus on students, particularly retention and learning, achievement and success, their engagement. Oh, but if this is a horse race, here comes the faculty concerns, teaching and research, institutional affordability. This is great. This is great. Okay, you can keep you can keep voting. I'm going to continue to uh, discuss some of these issues. So, all right, all of these things um, that we have. Uh, to consider, and here was my brainstormed list. While you're while you're voting, I thought of other things besides what's on the poll. So, how do all of these things connect with eBooks? They're certainly concerns of the institution, but how does this how does this impact eBooks? To make the connections between eBooks and what institutions care about, we need to think beyond our normal habits. We need to try to see the library, and in this case, eBooks specifically, through the lens of a non-librarian. We need to focus on the needs and goals and outcomes of others and be thoughtful about how our ebook services and collections meet those needs and goals and outcomes. So, for example, do ebooks help retain students? Well, we know that there are a lot of things that impact retention, and many of the things libraries can't really uh, influence, can't do anything about. that connect students to other students and students to um, the uh, professors and staff and so on on their campuses and make them feel connected. And when they feel connected, they stay. So one of those practices is common reading assignments. Many campuses have a common reading that entering students uh, do before they um, uh, come to campus so that they all have a, a common experience. So for example, and we're thinking creatively here, uh, if the common reading text is in your ebook collection, that's a pretty um, uh, connected idea. So you want to retain students. You have these high impact practices. The library supports those high impact practices. The common reading is just one example um, uh, to sort of stand in for that type of connection between potential connection between what the library institution cares about and uh, our ebook collections. What about student learning, achievement, success? however you define it or however you describe it at your institution. Could you make an argument that greater access to resources via ebooks, because they're always available, have concurrent use, et cetera, helps students do better academic work or do it at all? What if the ebooks are textbooks too, either required texts or recommended? Now you're impacting not only student learning, but faculty teaching and institutional affordability. Do students who use ebooks get better grades? I don't think we know this definitively, but we have a growing body of research demonstrating correlations between library resource use and better grades, although they're not parsed down to the ebook level, to my recollection. If you haven't read up on these studies, you'll want to look at the JISC project at the University of Huddersfield, the Library Cube at the University of Wollongong, and the recent work at the University of Minnesota. It's all very exciting stuff where they're able to collect use of library resources with uh, improved grades and in some cases, improved retention. And um, while they're not separating out um, e-books, to my knowledge, as part of that, that seems like a step down the road. Depending on the content of the e-book e collections you provide, I could also imagine a number of other arguments being made. Say you have a great business e-book collection, and access to those e-books is possible in the building or otherwise. Could you argue that you're helping support the local workforce and economy? Maybe. So the, the goal here, then, is to see what does the institution care about. We've brainstormed some of these things, and you guys have weighed in on them with, uh, looks like, oh, who's our winner? 
click student retention followed by student learning um, is, uh, is, is top notch on this poll. Um, connecting these things to the ebooks is really critical when you're making an argument for the impact of the ebooks on things that your constituents, your stakeholders, your users, your administrators care about. All right, so let's look in, in detail, um, in more detail, at one researcher's work that focuses on one of these I haven't mentioned so far faculty productivity in the areas of teaching and research. Carol Tennifer at the University of Kentucky, who's also involved in the Light Val. Uh, lead value um, project that's IMLS funded, has done a lot of research into the value of academic reading. So not specifically ebooks, although that's part of the picture. So this is um, early research if you're only interested in ebooks, but it's, it's sort of part of a trajectory here. And she's found, among other things, that faculty read about 22 articles, 7 books, and 10 other publications on average per month. It takes them about 40 hours. Two-thirds of these articles come from library collections. And right now, scholarly books are more likely to be in print than in e-format, in electronic format, at least for now. But the exciting thing with this, that this research is that she's able to connect this reading with improved research results, changed research focus, new thinking, improved teaching, all of these things that institutions really care about. And it, she's connecting in a way that should be you know, probably pretty obvious us as librarians, but we had no data or evidence to support that we're providing the things that faculty read, and when they read them, they have better research, um, they have uh, new thoughts and new concepts, so they're innovating, and they have better teaching, all things that the institution cares about. So it's connecting the dots, which is really exciting. Okay, so this is the thing, kind of uh, data and evidence and study that is really, really compelling to everyone resource allocators included. It shows what difference it makes when you invest in libraries, and today we're specifically talking about ebooks. So I'm sort of curious if you've thought of other things that your institution cares about. My, I sort of had a limited list on my slide and even more limited list for you to vote on. But if other connections between ebooks and institutional or user goals spring to mind, I really do hope that you share those either here in the webinar or with your colleagues at your institution, because I really believe that that um, is incredibly important to this conversation. All right, so let's recap. To get at the value of ebooks from an impact perspective, we have to see where institutional needs, goals, and outcomes, like the ones we've discussed, intersect with ebook services, resources, and librarian expertise. Where these two things connect, ebooks have value. Not that they don't have other kinds of value, but when we're talking about value to the institution, value within an institutional context, and impact, this is where the value comes from, where the intersection is between what the institution or your users need and want and the services, resources, and librarian expertise that we provide. You could, by the way, take that um, sort of uh, rudimentary drawing and build it out into a chart that might help you and your colleagues at your institution. You could, on either independently or with your, your friends and colleagues, use this idea to kind of spur your conversations in this area. You know what's most important on your campus, the two or three most important things. And if you don't, you can read the president or provost um, speeches. You can follow the money. That will surely tell you what's valued. Uh, there's many ways you can discover what's really important on your campus. And you know, obviously, what you offer in terms of e-books in the library, in terms of services, resources, and expertise. So juxtaposing those two concepts in a chart form allows you to think systematically about where you can find ebook value. So if you're, you know that's very important, retention, recruitment, and learning, you know, how do those things intersect with the, um, this, the resources, the ebook resources you provide, the services around it, the instruction and reference service that you've built around it, that sort of thing. Where those two things intersect, that's where your impact is. That's where your value comes from. So if you want to have this conversation with your colleagues, these are really the three um, starting questions that you might begin with. What are the focus areas at your institution? What does your institution and your users care about? What ebook collection services or expertise does the library offer? And where do these two things intersect? OK, so once you find the areas where you can expect an impact to be made, where you have an intersection, the next challenge is to demonstrate ebook value through assessing and documenting these, e these impacts. Here's a graphic representation of that, of the entire process. 
you can see here in the, the left-hand side what we already talked about. The campus has needs, we have services, expertise, and resources, and the impact value comes from that intersection. But moving to the right, moving from left to right, the next step after locating the areas of impact is to document that impact in some way, and usually that means assessment. So the next question you might be thinking is, what do we need to assess or to demonstrate the value of ebooks in academic libraries? We need to know several things. First, we need to know the mission, goal, strategic priorities, or focus areas of the parent institution, of our overarching institution. We've already sort of belabored that point a little bit. We could really use some well-defined outcomes that describe those areas of impact that we found. So we need to have So these outcomes could follow something like this structure. Users, and you could substitute your you know, stakeholder or user um, subsection, subcategory, will be able to do, and then the things that the institution values. So here are a few examples. Students will be able to evaluate information found in ebooks effectively. Faculty will be able to teach effectively using ebooks. Faculty will be able to complete competitive grant proposals using ebook literature. These are all sort of simplified, but essentially there's these two components, the user group that you're looking at and the thing that they're going to be able to do with your ebook that is of value to your institution. Third, we definitely need better data. We need better use data from our side in-house in the library, from the vendor side, and we need better data about our users. So we need three different types of better data. For example, we need better use data. Here's the thing. We need to know not just, um, well, we need to know what ebook use exists currently. We need to be able to do that so that we can correlate other library behaviors um, with measures of institutional success, so downloading and using ebooks with uh, the outcomes that we want to see. But what we have right now in terms of use data is pretty inadequate. We need to know, by the way, not just what use there is, but we also need to know what use is not happening. And this is very difficult to um, capture because it's not happening. So what use data doesn't exist? This is use data that doesn't exist yet. This is data about the gap between what's being used and what should be being used when it comes to ebooks. So questions that you could pose to get at this data might include questions like, what ebook resources should be being used? What ebooks are relevant? What does the curriculum or faculty research areas require from our ebook collection that we're not filling? And that could be either because you don't have those items in the collection, or you have them, but they're not easily discoverable. So there's the use that is happening, and then the use that should be happening. And that's sometimes, I think, a big challenge for libraries, is to analyze um, what resources they have that um, should be being used by courses and by faculty who are researching in different areas but aren't. So that gap is, is a challenge. We also need individual level data. I've gone into detail on this idea elsewhere, so I'm not going to belabor it too much. But we can't link ebook usage or anything else to positive outcomes if we don't know about the pos positive outcomes that are occur. So change, impact, making a difference. All of those things happen on an individual level, getting better grades, getting a grant uh, accepted, uh, having a paper uh, published, uh, being retained to the second semester, the second year, and all the way through graduation or program completion. All of these things happen to individuals. Libraries and ebooks specifically make a difference for individuals. So we need to know about that. We need to know what's happening with individuals, what difference it makes on that um, uh, individual level, not an aggregate level. We don't need all kinds of sensitive, personally identifying information. To, to do our analysis, but we do need to know more than we currently do so that we can investigate the linkages between ebook use and positive outcomes. We need some sort of a unique identifier to match up library use and those positive outcomes, but it doesn't have to be <laughs> name, social security number, and blood type. So we have to be very careful about how we use the data, um, but we need it or we won't know about the impact that our, e our, our ebook collections have or any other parts of our library for that matter. 
Okay, so let's let's take this one step further. Say we want to investigate the links between ebooks and positive outcomes, achieving goals and needs and so on. We need stand-ins or surrogates for both of those things. We need stand-ins that represent ebook use, like downloads, citations to ebooks, uh, library instruction that we know involves it, reference transactions that involve ebooks, interlibrary loan, I suppose, um, in some in some environments. And we also need stand-ins that represent um, the achievement of institutional goals, needs, and outcomes. So better grades, better teaching evaluation, more publications, more grants, whatever uh, fits that institutional need um, as, a, as a surrogate, as a stand-in for a data point. Armed with these two components, the surrogate for ebooks and the surrogate or stand-in for outcomes, we could then build some research questions or hypothesis that we could uh, investigate. And the formula that you would follow to do that, to write a research question, would be sort of like this. If this is a little hard to read, by the way, this is also available on my website uh, in a bigger form. Um, hopefully, you can you can make it out. This formula sets up a tentative correlation that could lead to a really really interesting ebook value research results. So you are juxtaposing a library service in this case, provision of ebooks and the services and instruction and and other uh, areas of librarian expertise that surrounds that with some institutionally desired, out, desired outcome, better grades, um, getting a job, you know, being more engaged, being retained, publishing a book, getting tenure, whatever. And then you have to figure out what the relationship is. So did ebook use impact, contribute, affect, influence, relate to getting tenure or getting a grant um, accepted or getting an A on a paper, et cetera? I should probably add one caveat to this because it may be in your mind. Um, correlation is not causation. That takes a lot of time to really explain in detail. But if this is of interest to you, um, then some of the, the points on the slide might be interesting as well. It's very difficult. It's actually impossible to demonstrate causation. You can infer it by a really, really strong correlation. But particularly in educational assessment, it's incredibly difficult to isolate all variables. We are not operating in a lab setting. We cannot use a randomized control trial. We cannot withhold ebooks from part of our population. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of difficulties. We don't know all of the things that influence our students uh, and our faculty besides just what we are aware of. So the causation question is one that if, if you're seeking only to find a causal relationship between these two things, I think you have a real challenge ahead. I think a strong correlation will be a great goal uh, instead. Um, I think really we need to question, you know, do librarians, do we need to say that they, we are the only ones that are helping students get better grades or faculty get tenure or get a paper accepted or a grant funded? Or are we part of a team? Is it enough to describe the profile of successful library users, ebook users, and then seek to increase people that use um, to have that same profile. So if we know, for example, that use of e-books um, as textbooks makes it um, more likely that students of a particular social economic status are retained, say we were able to determine that, that there was a high correlation between those things. We don't necessarily need to say that, they, that having an e-book caused that retention, but it was part of the picture, part of the profile. So we would encourage other faculty, for example, to adopt an e-book as a textbook in this example. So our, our issue is to improve and to try to help people emulate successful attributes, then we don't need this whole causation thing. But I, I know it comes up and it can be, a, can be a real stumbling block for some folks. OK. So once we have some measure or indication or even just a belief about the value of ebooks, how do we communicate that to our users and to our stakeholders? I noticed at the poll at the outset that most of you do not have communication or marketing as a core part of the, or the major part of your job. Um, but I suspect that many of you have to do that as part of your job, even if it's not written into your job description. So let's talk about that a little bit. Incidentally, this is also the next stage in the process of the, uh, the graphic I was using to sort of guide uh, thinking about this. So it's the next stage in the process if you're following along with the graphic. So I, sort of, I would like to turn this back around to you for you to ponder, you know, what do your communications about ebooks really look like? In my experience, I find that most ebook communications focus on 
uh, one of a few things. Either the eBooks are exist in the first place. You know, look at our collection. Look how great we, you know, what great resources we have. We have this book. We have that book. Uh, how to locate those books in the collection? So the just the nuts and bolts of of finding the eBooks, uh, discovering them through the catalog or other discovery tools, and how to navigate the eBook interfaces once you've gotten that far. So some some communications also proclaim the ease of accessing eBooks, so they might talk about that attribute. It's so easy to access our eBooks, or the great range of subject areas covered in the eBook collection. So it's either how to, or um, going back to those attributes that we heard about in the higher education literature, saying, look, it's easy, or it's 24-hour um, access, those sorts of attributes. Usually that's what the focus is. That's fine. That's great. And I have seen some fantabulous um, live guides and promotional materials and posters and all sorts of things that really are fantastic examples of communicating those things. But they're not necessarily emphasizing ebook value in a way that links to what institutions, users, and stakeholders care about, at least not in the way that we've been having or we've been discussing today. So just like with that literature that I mentioned earlier, talks about the pros and cons of ebooks. The kinds of communications I usually see focus on the pros, of course, not the cons of the ebook collection, and the how-to, but not what difference they make, not um, anything that's going to speak to those institutional needs, the goals of individual users, etc. In fact, they tend not to even be focused on the other dimensions of ebook value. It's not that I see um, communications that are focused on satisfaction or um, service quality or even usage. So I would encourage you to review your ebook communications and marketing with a fresh eye. Sort of think about how can we link our ebook collections to the needs and goals and outcomes of our users, our stakeholders, and our institutions. How can we connect those two things? How can we make um, it clear that there is a real impact to using these resources? They're not nice to have, they're need to have because they uh, influence the attainment of goals of the institution overall. So if we follow this entire idea through, we'll have some great ways to demonstrate, to prove um, the value of eBooks towards students doing their academic work, faculty teaching better than ever, and so on. I mean, what if we could really demonstrate the contribution of eBooks to you know, getting through a program, a student achieving a degree, to being good, lifelong, sophisticated users of information, to getting jobs, to recruiting great faculty because they know they're going to have the resources they need, to make teaching better because there's access to the resources they need that's quick, easy, 24-hour access, unlimited seats, et cetera, to getting grants and publications, to tenuring and promoting successful faculty members, and to really upping the profile, the prestige, or at least the brand, if that's affordability or accessibility of an institution to the community in which it resides. I think even more importantly than that, even more importantly than demonstrating the contribution of eBooks, is the last part of the graphic that I haven't spoken to yet. That's the part where at each stage of the process, whether it's assessment, documenting the impact, communicating the impact, all of this goes back into thinking about the services, the expertise, the resources that we provide when we're um, uh, focusing in on our eBooks. So what if we could use what we know about eBooks to make teach, to teach users to be even better, even more sophisticated users of information, to be able to do their academic work even more successfully and quickly, and to achieve their goals in, in greater numbers. What if they could get better paid jobs because of what we what we've learned, what we how we use what we've learned about the contribution of eBooks? What if we are able to grow increasingly the profile, prestige, and reputation of our institutions? So uh, I guess that's the, the main idea I want you to take away with, that you know, in the continuous improvement that this whole process can bring about at each stage in the effort to define, demonstrate, and communicate ebook value, we need to remember uh, to reflect on the ways we can improve our ebook services and collections, but also use that reflection and continuous change to improve the value of the collections. So not just prove, but improve. OK, and with that, I'll open the floor to questions. I really appreciate your time and attention, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say or questions that you have to ask. Thank you. Um, 
This is uh, Christy again, and uh, Megan, we've got uh, quite a few questions, uh, and a few of them are along the lines of uh, interlibrary loan. And so I'll, p I'll put that out there to both you and Dan. Um, and, and one is, can ebooks be interlibrary loaned? And um, an another is one aspect I haven't heard addressed, uh, but maybe it will be addressed, is the ability to share ebooks among libraries. Um, so maybe you can speak on that. Dan, why don't you take that one? Because that usually has to do with the agreements um, that, that librarians sign. So can you speak to that for Springer? Dan? I just totally responded while my phone was on mute. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Um, <laughs> speaking on behalf of Springer, um, I, I, I haven't checked with this since we installed the full book download functionality on Springer Link, but at least historically on the chapter level, we did allow for ILL as long as it adhered to CONTU guidelines, which is a little wonky because they haven't been updated since the 70s, but um, it is built into our license that we do allow for ILL. Great. Um, the, another, another question we had is, um, do your institutions want you to calculate how many e-books you have, both those you subscribe to and those you own, and how have you gone about it? That sounds like that's another Dan question. I don't actually have institutions. Can you say that again, Christy? Um, sure. And do your institutions want you to calculate how many ebooks you have, both those you subscribe to and those you own, and how have you gone about it? Um, <laughs> I, that, that's kind of a weird one. Um, we we. We let everybody know um, in their licenses what ebooks they're purchasing. At least from a Springer standpoint, we don't really operate on the subscription model. So all ebooks that all all ebook acquisitions that are made are purchased. So um, once once and, and it's by subject collection and then copyright year. So once that copyright year is over, you own whatever is in that subject collection. I, I'm not sure if that necessarily answers the question, but Sure. And, um, and then there was a question about, um, about the sort of value measurement on paper collections, that we, do, we don't have this sort of value measurement on paper collections either, but perhaps I'm missing yeah. something here. Um, well, yeah, so, um, I'm, so, that I'm, so I'm going to, I th what I think I, you're saying, <laughs> what I think you're saying is that we don't have this kind of uh, research with the with the print collections, um, and that is, I guess, mostly true. Um, gosh, my Princess Bride mostly dead. Um, so I think that that we have to recognize that this sort of conception of value and impact is. Um, not brand new. Certainly there have been um, voices uh, uh, saying that this is the way to look at library impact and value um, for many years. I discovered that uh, in doing the value report. But it's, it's definitely a, a relatively new emphasis for the profession as a whole nationally to uh, sort of look at value from this perspective, from the institutional perspective and what we enable people to do, so the impact um, issue. Uh, so because that is true, and we know that um, scholarship, because we're librarians, we know that scholarship can be a very slow process, it, it is a situation where we're, we're waiting for some of this uh, research to come to fruition. There are many, many, many projects uh, in the works, and not all of them have been presented or published on. But I would point um, uh, that questioner, and I'm not sure who it was, um, to look at the JISC and the Library Cube information, and particularly the um, research coming out of the University of Minnesota. And there are others um, that I've mentioned in other presentations, some that are more closely related to teaching and learning at the University of Wyoming, for example, uh, that are connecting resource usage with things that the institutions care about, like um, successful 
um, uh, research and teaching, so like Carol's work, um, and uh, successful student um, uh, markers like GPA and other kinds of learning. So there, there actually are um, some very notable and great um, exemplars in this area, but I think we're going to see a lot more as we go forward. Um, for example, at the Library Assessment Conference, we're seeing increasing numbers of, of uh, proposals and, and accepted presentations that take sort of this as part of their, their uh, approach. So, you know, research is a slow, the wheels turn slowly, but I wouldn't say that, there, that we're not looking at the print collections in that way, um, but rather we are starting to. And there are some um, results out that are really worth looking at and emulating. I hope that I hope that gets at the at the intent of that question. And um, how an, another one here? How would you promote ebook collections uh, to faculty? Any suggestions there? Um, I'll let Dan take this one too. But let me let me have a first stab at it. I really think you have to do it in the in the context of the things that faculty care about. So faculty, depending on what kind of institution you're at, at some institutions, you know, research trumps all. So to what um, uh, to what benefit are the ebooks in um, for them in terms of doing their research? Um, or if you're at a liberal arts institution or, or a big institution that cares about teaching or a community college and so on, um, where teaching is the most important thing, then you can talk very concretely about using ebooks as resources in their classes. Um, uh, one of the required textbooks in my course uh, this semester is, a, is an ebook. Um, uh, or um, uh, teaching students to use those in their, in their academic work. So have, they have real, I mean, just like uh, their print um, counterparts, they have real impact on the teaching and learning and research missions of the institution. So you just have to draw those lines. I don't think that people outside of the library sit around trying to you know, connect the utility of library resources with what they do on a daily basis. So it's up to us to do it. So when that's your communication, um, or that's when you have a communication or a marketing message going out, not that the you know, how to do it and the look at the selection and we will help you, and those things are all very important to get across, but to what end? What difference does it make? That going back to that so what question, what difference does it make that we have these ebooks? How does that help you with your teaching? Does it save you time? Does it save the students money so that they can buy more books, <laughs> or save money uh, overall? I mean, what that's that's where we have to go with it to really think um, as others think, not as we think as librarians. To seek to understand before seeking to be understood. I, think, I believe is how Stephen Covey puts it. Uh, but Dan, I didn't know if you wanted to crack at that one as well. No, I, at least from um, in my experience working with a lot of the schools, um, they're, most librarians that I've worked with are very hesitant to market one product versus another. So it's kind of a delicate conversation whether or not um, you're willing to promote you know, or, or how you go about promoting e-books. Um, we try and facilitate that as much as possible, at least from uh, attending um, any sort of events held at the library, like student awareness days, and providing as much collateral um, giveaways. But that's, that's just one publisher versus another. Um, so that's kind of what I can give there. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that's a really good point. And you have to, you know, I, like I said earlier, you know, look at your communications with the light of a, through the lens of an outsider. So, um, for example, if you have a, a poster or a libguide or, you know, whatever, whatever the format is, and it's entirely about divisions between different um, providers of your ebooks, that is not, um, you know, foremost in the user's mind what bucket they're fishing in to find their ebook. They want the information in the ebook or the ebook itself, but you know, what what uh, logo is on it is not their primary concern. What their concern is is can they use it to write their academic uh, papers or you know, can they use it so they don't have to buy a book this semester? Or, um, you know, can they, are, do they want to publish an e-book? And how will that impact tenure decisions? Those are the things that are foremost in their mind. So those are the kinds of, um, that's sort of the lens that we need to look at these uh, communications through, rather than uh, treating them as if they will be read by librarians. And. Um uh, another one for you, Megan. How does the, how does assessing the value of ebooks differ from assessing the value of e-journals? 
Um, well, I think that it depends on I mean, my understanding from the folks that are, have been working in the trenches on this is that some of the data from the providers, from the vendors, is easier to look through from um, uh, when, when you're working with e-journals, at least right now. I believe that this is definitely a moving target. Um, but sometimes it can be difficult to, I mean, just simple um, pieces of information. Did they, um, for with an e-book, did they view one chapter, the whole book, multiple chapters? Um, because with e-journals, um, typically you can get article level data um, you can get more precise information about that. That's just that's just one example. So um, I really do believe and hope that you know ebooks will have the same evolution as these e-journals are having. So hopefully that distinction will go away. Again, just looking through at things through the lens of, of our students, they're looking for information. They don't care what what bucket, what format, um, unless they're required to by their assignments. They mostly are looking for resources that. <laughs> Prove their point, or or argue against their point, or something like that. They want the they want the information, not the not the bucket. Um, that's what they're most concerned with. So we need to try to move our system beyond that to the point where that's not making a significant um, that's, when that's so it's not a significant barrier to doing assessment of this kind. Makes sense. Well, there's there's so many great questions coming in. I I wish we had time to get to all of them. Um, and unfortunately, we don't. We have time maybe for for one more. Um, how how far how far can we go with analysis of individual data, and is it okay or not okay to work with data from PDF readers and PDF organization software? Um, i you know what I don't think I can speak intelligently about the PDF piece. Um, but I think the how far we can go with individual level data is, um, you know, I, th I think that the question there is is not how much information could we should we collect, but rather how careful should we be with it and how should we use it. So um, I think uh, if you've looked at the, the paper that came out recently through Educause um, on the Library Cube at the University of Wollongong, that's a great exemplar for this kind of thing. But you know. Most libraries that are moving forward with this, they're working in partnership with other units on campus that have a lot longer history of keeping this individualized data. I mean, certainly we have long histories of, of keeping data and, and, and paying attention to um, um, our users in that way, but not keeping, you know, we're, we trash the data as, as fast as we can get it or try not to collect it at all. Uh, other units on campus, institutional research, educational assessment, they have different names on different campuses, but they're in the business of trying to get students to graduate, ten, um, uh, faculty be, to become tenured. They want success. So whatever it takes to get that success, they'll do it. Now they're going to make sure the data is kept um, private, secure, and so on. So I think um, you know, some libraries are more comfortable with drawing that data down into their systems and managing it. Others are more comfortable with sending their data out to the campus-wide um, uh, data center so that someone else can analyze it and keep it keep it safe. Um, but I think that uh, you know while we don't need to know about individuals or what they you know what ebooks they looked at, we need to know that they did. I think that's an important distinction as well that I may not have made earlier. We're trying to build a profile of what does a successful user look like. So it doesn't matter that they checked out, you know, what's the classic uh, red flag, a uh, catcher in the rye or something, um, but that they were reading, you know, a certain number of books and looking at a certain number of e-journals and, you know, asking questions to the reference desk and doing this, that, and the other, and that all helped them become a more successful student that was retained, graduated, got a job, and so on and so forth. That's that's what we're looking at. So um, hopefully that helps in terms of what what information we need to keep. The PDF question, I don't think I can speak intelligently about it, so. I think I'll just defer that to, to Dan if you want to take it on, or um, or we can let that one go and go back to the go back to the group. I can't see everything that's going on on the screen for for you guys, but maybe you could help answer uh, that question as well. Well, it, it it looks like we are out of time. That it's three o'clock, so it, we we might have to let that one go for another time, unfortunately. Okay. 
Well, I really, really do appreciate this opportunity to talk with all of you. Um, uh, my contact information there is, is there on the screen. You can go to the website and get my email and, and, and ask me follow-up questions if you like. Um, but I really appreciate this opportunity, and uh, thank you for sticking with us. I can see that a lot of attendees have, have hung in there with us, and I really do appreciate that. Well, it looks like we are ready to wrap up. Um, I'd like to give a virtual round of applause to everyone today for sharing some great info. We really appreciate your time and your insights. As a reminder, we have recorded today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice that will include instructions on how you can access the archived version. Again, thanks again to 